Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to Silicon Valley Reads. Started in 2003 as a one book, one community program, Silicon Valley Reads has grown to become a thriving community engagement initiative throughout Santa Clara County, including books and events for all ages. Presented by the Santa Clara County Office of Education, the Santa Clara County Library District, and the San Jose Public Library, Silicon Valley Reads gives our community new perspectives and understanding of important, relevant issues and encourages people to read, think, discuss, and engage. The theme for 2021 is connecting. We are adjusting to living our lives in a pandemic with more solitude than ever before. This year, we are focused on finding our commonalities and talking about the things that bring us comfort and joy. We've selected 10 books to encourage everyone to find the connections that are uniquely meaningful to them, whether through relationships, food, nature, art, music, animals, or books. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. Thank you, and welcome to Silicon Valley Reads. Uh, this is our program. We're wrapping up an amazing two months of programming. My name is Sal Pizarro. I'm a columnist at the San Jose Mercury News, and I'm thrilled to be here with our guests today, who will be talking about our connection to the environment, especially during this troubling time of pandemic. Now, we'll be hearing later on from David Yarnold, president of the National Audubon Society, who will also be bringing on a special guest. And, uh, and we'll have an opportunity for all of us to ask questions and talk to our panelists. Please ask your questions through the chat, and we'll get through as many of them as we can uh, towards the end of the hour. But first, I'd like to introduce Andrea McKenzie. She's the general manager of the Silicon Valley Open Space Authority. Uh, she has been a passionate person about preserving open space and connecting people to nature for more than 25 years. In 2016, Bay Nature Magazine named her local conservation hero, and she also serves on the advisory boards for the Bay Area Open Space Council, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, and Spur San Jose. Silicon Valley Reads has selected connectivity as its 2021 theme. Connectivity is such an important concept, especially during the time of COVID for both nature and people. When we talk about connectivity, we're talking about connecting with nature, focusing on wildlife populations, having room to roam, safe passage to connect to habitat, ability to find sources of food and mates to keep their genetic populations healthy, and to be able to adapt as the climate changes. Connectivity is also important in connecting people to nature, in and near our cities for physical health and mental well-being, and to ensure that people really understand why caring for nature and natural systems matters to the future of the planet. Many of you watching haven't had the ability to connect with nature during COVID-19 or perhaps as much as you would have liked. We have magnificent parks and open space here in the Santa Clara Valley. And I'd like to take you on a short aerial tour so you can get a bird's eye view of some of the beautiful natural areas that have been protected for you right here in your own backyard. So let's have a look.
like to introduce you to the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, where I work, and share some thoughts about connecting with nature during a global pandemic. For those of you who don't know us, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority is a public land conservation agency and special district created 28 years ago by the legislature and with the support of elected officials, community leaders, and ordinary citizens. Our mission is to balance growth by protecting, restoring, and caring for natural and working lands of the Santa Clara Valley in perpetuity and connecting people to the benefits of nature. As former Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell has said, we're in the business of forever. We're a small agency with a big mission and a big territory. We cover over 1,000 square miles or three quarters of Santa Clara County, and we serve approximately 1.4 million people. We operate a system of open space preserves that are open to the public 365 days a year, free of charge. Next slide, please. Nature benefits people in so many ways and protecting nature in the fast growing Silicon Valley is so important to the quality of life for all people. You may not know that Santa Clara Valley is one of the globe's biodiversity hotspots. It's rich in animal and plant life with numerous species found nowhere else in the world. Here at the Open Space Authority, we aim to protect and restore the most essential natural areas and agricultural lands remaining in the Santa Clara Valley for their multiple benefits for wildlife and people. And as the urban areas get denser, it's so important that people have access to green space. So the authority also invests its public money within urban communities for parks, trails, urban farms and gardens, and environmental education. At the authority, we believe that when we protect nature, she protects us, making our communities more resilient to the effects of climate change. And studies also show that kids that play outside are more likely to care about the natural world and to grow up to be empathetic human beings. Next slide, please. I think before COVID-19, we didn't fully appreciate just how vital access to nature is to our health and well being. When the shelter in place orders came down just one year ago, due to the COVID 19 pandemic, many parks and open space areas across the San Francisco Bay Area were shuttered. The Open Space Authority, along with Santa Clara County Parks, Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and East Bay Regional Park District, were able to keep their parks and open space open to the public, and this was considered an essential service. Our field staff directly engaged with the public, uh, albeit six feet apart, to help people feel welcome and comfortable and increase awareness and understanding of the safety protocols and practices that we were putting in place, like one-way trails. Indeed, parks and open space have been the great equalizer for residents during COVID-19 providing an important outlet and a relief valve for stress. COVID has shown us that access to nature is an equity issue. And now more than ever, access to nature is essential to the physical and mental well-being of all residents. Next slide. So I wanna show you a few statistics here to put COVID and conservation in context. First of all, you may not know that there are 1.4 million acres of protected open space in the San Francisco Bay Area, about 250,000 acres in Santa Clara County. That's 29% of the Bay Area preserved as parks and open space, and about 30% of Santa Clara County. Something that we found out during COVID-19 that really uh, surprised us. In 2020, we saw access to parks and open space and nature close to home in huge demand. At Open Space Authority Preserves alone, we saw a 95% increase in visitation. And what else was happening during this past year? We also observed that nature seemed to be catching a break during the COVID-19 pandemic as people stayed closer to home. We've all read stories or had direct experiences of greater sightings of wildlife, bird calls that were more audible, 
and the phenomenon of stillness and quiet. And here in the Bay Area, our air quality improved and our roads saw a dramatic decrease in automobile traffic. We had a 70% decrease in automobiles on Bay Area roads and up to a 29% decrease in air pollution. Next slide. Also during COVID-19, many of our parks and open space agencies turned to offering virtual programs, providing an opportunity to make nature accessible to more people. We partnered with a number of nonprofit organizations here in Santa Clara County, including Saved by Nature and Wildlife Education and Rehabilitation Center to offer nature-based programs, including bilingual programs, programs for seniors, children, and people with mobility challenges. And though we expect that virtual programming is here to stay as an element of our ongoing nature programming, we really look forward to a return to in-person outings and events after the COVID restrictions are lessened. Uh, next slide. So we hope you will connect with nature close to home here in the Silicon Valley. And I've highlighted here some beautiful natural parks and open spaces operated by both the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and its park partners that we encourage you to visit. On that top row, the Coyote Valley, Sierra Vista, and Rancho Cañada del Oro open space preserves operated by the Open Space Authority. The Sierra Azul open space preserve managed by Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. The Eulistac natural area, the last remaining undeveloped natural area in the city of Santa Clara, operated by the city and supported by the Open Space Authority. And Marshall Cottle Farm Park, operated by Santa Clara County Parks. So remember, as you go out to experience these and other natural areas in the county, remember to check the website of the agency that operates those places first. Bring a mask, dress in layers, wear good sturdy shoes, bring water and snacks. Remember to pack out whatever you pack in. And most of all, bring a great attitude and a sense of awe. Next slide. So we encourage you to sign up for our monthly email event calendar and get updates on both the virtual and in-person events that we're offering, like docent uh, guided hikes, wildflower walks, astronomy events, nature photography, family art days, and more. And next slide. So in closing, I'd like to say you can learn more about the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and the phenomenal natural areas that we protect and offer to the public by visiting our website at openspaceauthority.org. And again, it's been a pleasure to join you here today. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. I'll tell you, my family is one that has really been appreciating the Open Space Authority's work. We've discovered some new places uh, in Co the Coyote area has been amazing. So thank you, and I know we're gonna have some great questions for you later. But right now, I would like to introduce you to David Yarnold, who's president of the National Audubon Society and has been since September, 2010. Now the Audubon Society is a huge organization, and I think David's gonna be telling you a bit about that. But even though he's on the East Coast now, this is a bit of a welcome back to Silicon Valley for him. Uh, those of you who've been here for a while may or may not realize that David was the executive editor and later editorial page editor of the Mercury News, where I work, and we worked together there about ooh, a long time ago, let's say. And he's also a graduate of San Jose State University. So welcome virtually back to the Bay Area, David, and the show is yours. Thanks, Al. Um, before we start with the slides, uh, I want to offer Audubon sympathy and support for Asian American people across the country. You are in our thoughts. Um, and thank you for the invitation. It's always great to come back to California, even virtually. Um, why don't we go to the slides? So um, when COVID broke out last year in March, it was the beginning of spring migration. And as Andrea said, um, the air was cleaner, there were fewer people out, there were fewer, fewer cars out. And this is the question that we got most at Audubon 
um, in our 23 state offices, um, in our 460 chapters. Are there more birds this year? Um, and I must have been asked that question 10 times by journalists. And what we found was, as Andrea said, there was an unprecedented appetite for nature um, and for birds. Um, and then as summer came along, there was an extraordinary intersection last year with race and equity. And I'm going to try to cover all that fairly quickly. Um, so we knew that people were desperate to get outside, right? Parks were one of the few places um, where people were able to actually get out and see one another. Um, and that was universal. And it was um, even the New Yorker saw this. Next slide, please. Um, and there was this very cool New Yorker cover featuring um, a New Yorker spotting a northern cardinal, which is a year round bird in New York. Um, and people across the country could relate to that. Um, Audubon, um, because we couldn't take people out uh, in the numbers that we wanted to, and because there was such an unprecedented demand, because so many people were trapped at home, we took birding digital. Um, and one of the things that we did is we created a show. Next slide, please. We created a show called I Saw a Bird. Um, and it started, it was a Zoom based show. It also went on Facebook Live. We had hundreds of thousands of viewers. And among the guest stars on this weekly show were, and you can find them on here, Dr. Jane Goodall, Melissa Villasenor from and, um, Saturday Night Live, um, toward the center, a little tiny picture of Dr. Catherine Hale, one of the country's leading climate scientists, lower left is Jane Alexander, an Audubon board member and a Tony Award-winning actress. Um, slightly above and to the right is Lily Taylor, um, also uh, an award-winning actress and an Audubon board member. Um, and then lower right is Audubon board member Jeff Goodby, who um, is a partner, a founder of Goodby Silverstein Advertising. And he's the guy who created the Got Milk campaign and a lot of other things. So all these people were guests, and as were Audubon scientists, um, journalists from around the country, and everybody talked about birds and bird science, and the momentum around this thing was extraordinary. But the demand for that parents had for educational material, next slide, please, um, caused us to create Audubon for Kids, which was a set of interactive um, tools and games and um, educational um, experiences that kids and parents could share. So when we send an email, the usual rate for people to open that is around two or three percent. The Audubon for Kids site had a 25 percent open rate. I think that's because parents were desperate for stuff to do with kids who couldn't go to school. And people just loved this site. It had, we had scavenger hunts, um, art projects. Um, and there are, we've heard from more than a few kids who now say that they want to grow up to be an ornithologist. Next slide, please. And of course, um, last summer also marked a number of events. One of them was the, um, the racist attack on Audubon New York board member Christian Cooper in New York uh, in Central Park had national headlines, national attention. Um, and it was part of um, that summer of reckoning that um, we should all remember clearly. Um, and it also created um, a number of people uh, in the birding world uh, created Black Birders Week. Next slide, please. And Black Birders Week talked about, um, it was a, a way for folks to gather, to share experiences. It was a week-long event. Um, Audubon helped uh, promote those conversations. Some Audubon staff participated. Lots of birders from around America talked about how important it is for everybody to feel safe outdoors, um, wherever they are, um, whomever they are, a really important ongoing issue about equity in nature and something that matters a great deal to Audubon and I know to a lot of you. 
Um, and I want to share with you um, one of the spring miracles that I've had a chance to see. One of the great migrations on Earth is a short plane flight away from uh, the Bay Area. All you have to do is go to Omaha, Nebraska, and go up to Kearney, Nebraska on the Platte River in March. And you'll see the Sandhill Crane migration. Every year, these birds migrate from Texas and farther south up to the boreal forests and the Arctic. And 500,000 to 750,000 um, Sandhill Cranes that will migrate through. They land on the Platte River at night after feeding all day, and then they take off. And it is one of the most moving sites you can possibly imagine. And it's readily accessible to you. If you would like more interest about how to go um, and visit Audubon Center on the Platte River, just email me at dyarnold at david.yarnold at audubon.org. Happy to talk to anybody from Bay Area. Happy to share this with you. But let's take a look and listen to what this is actually like. This is from... Um, Carney, Nebraska. Let's do the video, please. It really is that amazing. Um, it's a bucket list thing to do um, for your life. Um, you definitely should take advantage of it. It's well within reach. You don't have to go, you know, to some other continent. It is a three hour plane flight away. Um, so thank you all. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Vayun Tawari. Vayun is a junior at Harker High School in San Jose. Hey, Vayun. Um, Vayun has been birding for a few years, and he's interested in bird photography. In fact, he's really good at it. Um, Vayun is part of youth programs at local conservation societies, like the Santa Clara uh, Audubon Society and the San Francisco Bird Observatory. And he's used his pictures to help raise fund for those or funds for those organizations. And he's the winner of the youth category in the 2020 Audubon Photography Awards. Bayan, welcome. Hi. Pleasure to be so, here. So, yeah, it's nice to ha it's nice to see you. So, um, what are you doing in this picture? I want to ask you how you got into birding, but what are you doing in this picture? Okay, so this photo was in Ecuador, and I was experimenting with stop flash photography. So what we would do is set up flashes around a hummingbird and wait for it to come. And then we'd set off the flash and it would capture the hummingbird perfectly in just like freeze it in the motion. And in this photo, this is a buff tailed coronet, which is very common in Ecuador. And in my mouth, I have a flower. And this was probably one of my favorite photos from the entire trip with uh, me and the bird making eye contact. That's a pretty cool picture of Ion. Let's go to the next image. So um, you started early. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this I, was a very birding. young age. How'd you get into birding? I got into birding mainly because of my dad. I was, I have memories of birding in strollers before I could even walk. <laughs> so here I was, this is at a bird banding place and here I am with a house wren, and I distinctly remember holding the house wren in my hand, and it was very spiky. And all I wanted, I remember my sister had held it before, and all I wanted to do was hold it. And by like at that moment, I think that was my first distinct memory of me out birding. And from that point on, I was hooked. That's pretty cool. Let's look at the next picture. More proof that you're hooked. Uh... 
Only now you've got a camera in your hands. Yeah. So I first started photography at age seven. We were in the Everglades for my sister's birthday at the time. So I was seven. It was really hot. Imagine the Everglades in the middle of April in the, at 4 p.m. So I had nothing really to do and I was really exhausted. So my dad had given me one of his cameras, one of his old cameras. And I just started taking photos of anything I could see. <laughs> do you remember what you got that day? Yeah, uh, that day, it should be in the next slide, is a great blue heron with a fish. And this was my one of my very first photos. And also, it is surprisingly one of my very best photos, although the camera quality wasn't that great. But again, from this moment, I was always interested in birding, but when I combined it with photography, it, it kind of became a passion from that moment on. So I've been birding for more than half my life. I'm 16 now. So, so great, great blues are awesome. They're the most common big bird in America. And everybody, everybody loves to see a great blue. Yeah. Hey, next slide. Tell us All about right, this. So this one is more local. This is a bald eagle at a local elementary school. So this bald eagle has been here for a few years now. It has a nest high up in the tree. And my dad and I were waiting for this eagle all afternoon. We were trying to get, uh, we were trying to climb up onto the playground structures, trying to see into the nest. And finally, the adult uh, bald eagle took off and I'd gotten this amazing shot of it in flight. Hey, good for you. That is a tough picture to get. Um, next slide, please. Where's this? All right, so this one is in Peru off the Tumbopada River. So I also do photography outside of the U.S. Uh, recently, my dad and I have traveled to the neotropics a lot. So here there's scarlet macaws, and in the top left corner, there's a red and green macaw. So what these macaws are doing is that they're eating on clay. This is um, a cliff of clay. So they need this clay to stabilize the acid in their stomach from the other foods they eat. So... What they so what people do is they wait for these macaws to come up onto the clay and it creates wonderful photo, photography opportunities. Well, not just that, but when, if you ask questions about why birds do things, you learn things about ecosystems and about biodiversity. Like, why does this bird eat clay? Right. It's it's a fascinating window into biodiversity. Um, next slide, please. So this is the big prize winner. Tell us about this picture. All right, so this one was taken in Belize. Um, it was taken near the Lamanai archaeological site, which, yeah, so it's off a river. This, fo this photo is actually taken off a, off a boat. We were in a boat. So off, on this river, it's kind of a swampy area, as you can see in the background, lots of tall grasses. So there's a lot of these northern jacanas there. And I had found one that was isolated looking down into a flower. And I thought that was a really interesting sight. And also the, you can't really see the eyes, but I still think this photo is really cool because of the composition of it and how it's looking directly in. And something I find really interesting about this photo as well is that the crown and the beak of the bird almost look like a candy corn. So although this photo isn't one where you can see the face, it's still a really, um, interesting photo and um, interesting photos are the stuff that people like. They don't like photos just sitting out in the open. They want something different. So that's why I believe this one won. Hey, Vayun, it, it's kind of amazing. You did this from a boat. And I, I it's it said in uh, that, that you shot this at one three hundred and twentieth of a second and held. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So uh, it so was Maybe some luck involved, but I'm glad to get the phone. That's pretty awesome. Next slide, please. Tell us about this. All right. So um, aside from photography, I'm interested in all aspects of birds. So right now I'm working on a research project, my own uh, led research project. So there's a local uh, bird count called the Palo Alto Summer Bird Count, which is similar to the Christmas one that Audubon does, except it's in the, um, May in the summertime. So I recently have gone to these um, counts and 
one of my dad's friends and he runs the Palo Alto summer bird count. And he's, uh, he's, he does the main data collection. He lended me 40 years of data from 1981 up till 2017. So recently I worked on putting these onto a website where you can search for a few of the local species and it shows you population graphs over time. So I'm hoping to do more research with this, like looking at land usage, like if Google had made more buildings in shoreline area, what has happened to some of the shorebirds. So some of my favorite species to look at are the black for, for data purposes are the black headed grosbeak. So this one has been in decline, as you can see. The next one is the Eurasian collar dove, which was actually an, an invasive and introduced species. And as you can see, it's kind of taken over all of California. Yeah, and the yeah. last one is the Western bluebird, which um, has been at a really low number in the late not, not 19, late 20th century, but recently because of conservation efforts like bird boxes and stuff, it's made a really sharp um, population increase. Well, it's great to see that kind of science. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right. And now this is also one of my favorite photos. This is a blue-throated hill star in Ecuador. So this species was actually discovered in August of 2018. And my dad and I had gone to see it in August of 2019. So when I had gone to see it, we were one of the very few people to actually have seen this bird. So this is high up in the Andes, around 3,000, 4,000 meters. It had taken an entire one day journey, almost like 12 hours on the car, getting lost wow. in the middle of the Andes in Ecuador. And we had finally got to this place. And in, in the morning when we woke up to go see this species, it was cloudy and there was almost, it was like, this, uh, there was actually no chance of seeing this f bird. It was raining, almost hail, sleet. Yeah. Our car got stuck in the mud and we had to walk back. By the time we had gotten back to the little route, rock outcrop where we were staying, our umbrellas were torn to shreds. So eventually the weather calmed down and we had went out to see it and i noticed a small speck flying around and that had to be the hummingbird because nothing else can really exist up here at this temperature and altitude so at that moment i was just satisfied with like the entire journey because that's all i really wanted to see was the hummingbird but we waited and it kept coming closer and closer and this photo it came no more than five feet away from me I actually have wow. to zoom out of my large lens to get this photo. Wow. And that is really awesome. It's a great story. It's an amazing picture. And the fact that you were able to blur the background being that close, that's incredible. That is an amazing picture. Do we have more pictures or we have more questions for you for later on in the uh, program? Let's yeah. So this one is also more local. This is a common yellow throat. So aside from going on, uh, birding trips with my dad i do um fledglings which is a me and a bunch of other young birders go out and try to see how many species we can see in uh in a set amount of time so this was taken in shoreline which is local and yeah that's just Hey, that's Bayoun, another if, great if, way to interact. Bayoun, with Bayoun, is that is that done through Santa Clara Audubon or some other organization? Yeah, this is done through Santa Clara Audubon. Why don't you drop in chat how to uh, participate if people want to do it? Hey, thanks for all these slides. We're it's really been great seeing your work. Um, let me hand this back to Sal, and we'll talk some more later. Great, thanks, David. Thanks, Bayoun. Uh I know we're going to have a lot of questions for you, uh, but now I'd like to invite David to come back and also Andrea to come back so we can have a little discussion about some of the things we've talked about. And honestly, what I want to start off with, uh, because we heard a lot about Vayun and how he got started in birding and uh, getting interested in the environment from a very young age. I'd really like to know how the two of you were drawn to this work and the environment. And Andrea is smiling, so I'm going to start with her. 
Let's uh, let's hear your stories. Well, thanks for that question, uh, Sal. And uh, I first want to just say how moved I was by that picture of Bayoun as a young boy holding uh, the bird. Uh, I think that's how it all starts. It all starts with an amazing uh, interaction with nature. And I think David can probably relate to this, but when we were growing up as kids, you went out to play and you got home in time for dinner. And other than that, you, the, you know, the, the woods, the forests, the, the grasslands were your backyard to play in and discover nature. And it's, um, that's really how it all started for me in upstate New York. And I also remember back in the day, one of my favorite programs to watch was Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I actually thought the host's name was Mutual of Omaha. But I love to watch those shows. And that's what kids grew up on, was just really getting high on, on watching nature and being in nature. And so it sounds like that's that's where, uh, you know, that, that running out in the back in upstate New York kind of just got you out there and you never left. I know you went to UC Santa Barbara as I, as did I. So that's another beautiful place to discover the environment and see the butterflies and uh, the coastline. But now David, when I knew you at the Mercury news, uh, pretty much our entire lives revolved around journalism. Uh, so I didn't know you as much of an outdoors person, but tell me how, how this became part of your life. Well, actually my, um, my second job uh, was in a backpacking and camping store. So uh, I, you know, I did a bunch of the mirror trail um, when I was in college. Um, but yeah, you and I knew each other when I was a journalist. And then I made a, a career, a, a kind of a, an odd career move um, to the environmental world. I went to environmental defense fund and then went to Audubon about 11 years ago. And I wasn't a birder before I came to Audubon, but I am now. And um, I get to go out with really great birders. Um, and what I've learned is what I talked about with Bayoun is that if you ask a question like, why, um, you know, why does uh, a wood thrush have a, you know, a white chest feathers? You know, the answer might be, well, because uh, it um, goes up to the Arctic and that's the color of the rocks where it m makes its family. Right. So you, you can travel through ecosystems you know, you can you, you learn about the world just by asking questions about birds. And then the other reason I came to Audubon is that Audubon is a nonpartisan um, membership organization of two million um, dedicated to grassroots um, conservation. And America needs more uh, nonpartisan organizations and it needs people at the grassroots to help legislators do the right thing for birds and for people and for conservation. And it does feel sometimes like we, like politics is involved in everything now. Uh, so it is good to have nonpartisan organizations, but this year, especially it feels like, you know, with black burgers week, with the issue that happened in New York for the Audubon society, social issues and the environment have always sort of, run up against each other. Uh, I do want to lead into the idea, though, that you know, we had this extraordinary year of, of COVID-19, and so many things changed. What do you guys see as sticking? You know, what changes can we hope are going to continue, and what do you think might bounce back as, as things normalize and people get vaccinated? Uh, Anyone can jump in. Well, I, I, I think I, I think a lot of people remembered why they love being out in nature. And I think a lot of people became birders. Um, and Bayoun's a really good example that, you know, once that bug bites you, um, you know, it, it can stick. So I, I, I think that's likely to happen. Um, I think people are going to figure out how to get together and, you know, uh, go birding digitally um, and to share um, their love of nature uh, digitally. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think I think people are going to be more attuned to migration, at least for the next couple of years. Mm. Andrea, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I would echo kind of what David said. I think uh, a broader U.S. public fell in love with nature in, in the last year. People 
slowed down um, in some cases by design, in some cases by necessity, but they slowed down enough to take in a view, to listen to a bird call, to walk on a trail by themselves or with a loved one. And um, that uh, precious connection with nature, I think, just was infused in so many people. And so, you know, there's pros and cons to it, but we're, we're all seeing that the numbers of people visiting national parks, state parks, our local open space preserves has just risen significantly. So yes, we'll have to manage, learn to manage higher numbers of people. But I think in some ways that's a good problem to have. We want people to love nature and to advocate for it and to talk to their elected officials about why it's important to advocate for funding and to make sure that the next generation is coming up to, to lead uh, the next environmental movement, um, albeit a, a more equitable one. So I think that that is one of the silver linings, if you will, of what this last year has been all about. Great. Now, Vayun, have you been able to share your experiences as a birder and a photographer with your peers during this year? And is that something people have asked you about, especially as you've gained a little uh, notoriety for your award? Uh, yeah. So last year during school, I had started a club with my friend. We called it the Wildlife Photography Club. And we didn't get that many members, but it was a good start just to like get the school community kind of primed and ready for if, if we can go back, I'll restart the club and get more people involved. And like what David had said, a lot of my family friends, especially younger ones, well, the age of 10 and around that age, I've also started getting really interested in photography. A lot of them have started contacting, contacting me about um, where it's a good place to take photos, what, what are good cameras to get and stuff like that. And I think especially online, this is a great time to kind of expand that growth. Like it's really easy to go and give talks. Like I've given talks about my trips to Ecuador and other places and retirement communities. I've given talks. So it's just a great way to connect to people who otherwise wouldn't have really been interested in birding. Like even my teachers, when I invited a few of my teachers to my talks and they've been really interested in and asked me questions during class about birds. So I find that really enjoyable. Well, and along those lines, David, I wanted to ask you when, if somebody is interested in birding and they're kind of afraid, they, they, they've seen these pictures, they know that the Audubon Society exists. How do they get involved? In it? What, what do they need? Is there a big, a big lift here for people? Uh, it's actually really easy. Um, you can go on to audubon.org and there, there's content around how to be, how to be a beginning birder. Um, you know, there's people you can go out with, you can go out with your own field guide. You know, you don't have to spend a thousand dollars on a pair of binoculars, um, a field guide and, and there's online guides. Of course, there's an Audubon online guide as well and other good online guides too. Um, really the key is just to go out and learn how to observe and learn how to listen, not be intimidated by it, just enjoy it and um, be a little patient. And it's amazing how much you can learn. Um, and then, you know, you can go out with local Audubon Society members or other birders and um, and so, you know, starting birding is as simple as just going outside and observing. Um, you also can do it in your own backyard, right? I mean, I think, as you pointed out, like the reach of the Audubon Society is huge. So it's not as though you have to live in a very wide open space. I mean, you can live in New York City and be a birder. You can live in San Francisco and be a birder. There's birds everywhere right now. Sure. Um, and during, my, during spring and fall migration. Um, you know, we're right on the cusp of spring migration. There's going to be birds coming through every community. And now's a really good time to go out. The other thing you can do is you can build a sanctuary in your own yard. Um, and it's actually really easy. You can plant native plants, right? So native plants are great for birds as opposed to some of the invasive type plants. And Audubon has a website called uh, Plants for Birds. And you can just search for that. And you can actually put in your zip code. And it'll show you what plants you can put on your patio, in your backyard, on your balcony, and what birds it will draw. 
and where you can get those plants. And so you can build your own personal sanctuary wherever you live. Awesome. Now I want to get to some of our uh, audience questions. We've got quite a few uh, stacking up here. The first one's for Andrea. It's from a, a single senior woman who she says she'd like to go on trails, but she doesn't want to go alone and she's too slow for hiking groups. Do you have any suggestions for her? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question, and I certainly understand it. And I would say the best way to get introduced to nature in your own backyard and, and to feel safe while you're doing it is to join an organized outing that's led by the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority or Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District or the Sierra Club or Audubon Society. You'll meet like-minded people. You'll have a program. You'll learn something. And it's just kind of a, a good way to get started. Um, actually, the Open Space Authority also supports a lot of nonprofit organizations with our local funds. And we actually support uh, an organization called Bay Area Older Adults. And this is to help seniors get out in nature um, close to home and have a, have a really amazing experience. So that's the best way to do it. It's almost like David said, you know, Try not to be intimidated, get together with some other people, like-minded people first, learn the ropes, and then you develop a comfort level. That's good advice. Uh, Vayun, we have a question for you, which is, is there anywhere specific that you would uh, like to go that you haven't been? Because you've traveled quite a bit, but have you, is there someplace you'd like to go that you haven't been to photograph a bird? Or is there a specific bird that's sort of your holy grail? that you're hoping one day to see and photograph? Yeah, so coming up, I hope to actually uh, visit Hog Island in Maine, which I, I hope it happens in this summer because of the uh, award of the contest I won. I was up. I, I have a trip there this summer in Maine. I hope to go. But other than that, some of the birds that I hope to see one of them is the resplendent Quetzal in Costa Rica. I remember when I was five, my dad got an amazing photo of it and I was just sitting on the curb. Uh, I kind of regret that moment and not being able to take a photo of the bird at that moment. So I hope to go there and kind of just, I want to see every species. I don't know if it's going to be possible, but if I start out young, I hope it's possible eventually. What do you think, David? Can he can he do it? Every species. <laughs> how many? What, what's your? How long is your life list now, by you? Right now, I think it's at six hundred. So you've got about ninety four hundred to go. You can do it. You've got a little. You have, you got a little time left. Yeah. Be a good career. So, uh, David, we've got a question about the migration that you showed uh, the sandhill cranes, which you know we have the sandhill road migration here in Silicon Valley, which is different. <laughs> Happens about 5.30 every day. Uh, yes. But do the Sandhill Cranes have any predators? Someone was wondering. Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. They must, but um, uh, the, when they're on the Platte River, they actually sleep standing in shallow water on the Platte so that and they sleep in packs um so that they deter attacks hmm. um, but i'm going to guess that you know the predator predators for um a bird that large are going to be um probably mammals um and probably the time of greatest risk is when chicks are young um, as family units, they stay together. And you can actually hear the difference in the juvenile calls and the adult calls. And that sound that you heard, if you go to the, it's called the Rose, R-O-W-E, Sanctuary in Kearney, Nebraska. And you go out in these blinds, they're like dugouts, you know, from a, a baseball field or something. Mm -hmm. And so the birds can't see you. And they're so loud that you, you can't hear the person next to you talking. Wow. That's, it's like a, it's like a newsroom uh, or at least back <laughs> in the day. It's, it is, it, it makes the hair on your, your arms stand up. It is really a kind of a, 
it's just an amazing experience to be a part of. And how long does that last, that, that sound, that period? That, so it's about a month-long migration. They come through the beginning of May, and they'll come through, they'll keep coming through the beginning of April, um, and they're headed up into the tundra to make new families. Oh, it's amazing. So, Andrew, we have a question about your organization, about the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, and how does it differ or complement the work of the other agencies you mentioned, like POST and the Mid-Peninsula Open Space Authority? Do you guys work together a lot? Yeah, we sure do. Um, Well, first of all, I just want to say that living in the San Francisco Bay Area for a conservationist environmentalist is is a blessing. Not only do we have a an amazing amount of biodiversity here. We're a biodiversity hotspot, but this is so much of where the environmental movement began. We have over, you know, as I said, 1.4 million acres set aside in uh, the San Francisco Bay area. And it's a team sport. There are so many different uh, agencies and organizations working together. There's a unique type of agency that seems to be unique to the Bay area. and They're called open space districts. And we have six of them. And almost every county has one. Uh, Some of them are multi-county districts. And they're in the business of protecting open space, natural areas, wildlife habitat, farmland for the benefit of the public, for the benefit of future generations. They're funded by taxes and grants. And they, by and large, are the ones who have acquired so much of this property for the public enjoyment. And we work closely with nonprofit organizations or land trusts like Peninsula Open Space Trust, uh, and there's other ones around around the, the Bay Area, save Mount Diablo. So we have public-private partnerships to protect habitat for wildlife and to connect people to nature. And uh, by working together, pooling our funds, pooling our, our resources uh, and our staffs, we get a lot more done. And so uh, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority is the new kid on the block. We were formed in 1993. We've been around for about... 28 years. Uh, but like I said, we're, we're a small agency with a big mission and a big territory. You don't have to always be a big agency or a big uh, nonprofit organization, but you've got to have a big vision. Uh, you've got to be bold and be willing to work with others and collaborate and be really innovative about how you get the job done. And so i um, really, really happy to be working for the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Great. Now, uh, Vayun, we've got another question for you, which is about the, well, it's about the web, basically. Uh, We have someone who wants to know if there's a website where people can see your photographs and if there's also a website available for the Palo Alto summer bird count statistics that you were talking about. Uh, Yeah, so for the statistics one, you can just go to www.pasbcstats.com. PASBC for Palo Alto Summer Bird Count, and then statistics, stats. And for my photos, I'm currently working on making a website to have all of these in like a sorted area for my photos. But if you want, if you just Google my name and look up photos, you should find plenty of links um, with plenty of websites from Flickr, eBird, even Santa Clara Valley Audubon page will have some of my photos awesome yeah, we'll so be looking those up mm-hmm. people people can also um <clears throat> find the audubon photography awards for this year and previous years on our website and there are some amazing pictures there well on that subject of taking pictures and and either one of you david or Bayun, could could speak to this since david i know you've got a big photography background yourself is this something that someone can get into with an iPhone or do you need really good equipment to, to become a, a bird photographer? <laughs> I think anybody can do it. I think if you, if you really want those blurred backgrounds and those really tight shots, um, you'll eventually gravitate to other kinds of equipment, but I've seen amazing pictures with iPhones. Um, Byron, what do you think? Yeah, I think with new technology, especially like mirrorless cameras are kind of coming into effect now and they're at the same price point as higher quality point and shoot cameras. Even setting up a feeder in your backyard and having a plant next to it with a mirrorless camera, you could get some pretty good shots of an Anna's hummingbird or 
if you like set up seeds, you could even get some wrens and stuff. So if you don't need that great equipment to start out, something like a simple mirrorless camera is good enough. Okay. That's good advice from an award-winning photographer. So we've got to take that. Hey, I have a question for Bayoun, Sal. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a, you have a career goal in mind, Bayoun? So I definitely think it will play a part in my career. I am interested in chemistry a lot. So with my research project, I'm f- thinking of ways where chemistry could even take effect into that. And I know when I apply to college, I'll definitely be a thought for maybe a major. So I, it, it will hundred percent play a big role in my life. And if it doesn't become an occupation, it'll be just like what my dad has now where he goes on trips with his camera, but it, it still is an amazing thing to do. David, I thought he was going to say your job that he would <laughs> want your job in the future. Uh, I wanted to want my job. <laughs> I think, I think we'd all want your job. It sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, now, Andrea, uh, I want to address this question to you first, but David, I would love to have you uh, or Bayoun speak to this uh, with your experiences. And that's how can we incorporate more nature into our school curriculums and our education systems, especially right now where, where most of our students are learning indoors? What can we do to, to, to bring that out? Uh, Thanks for that great question. Actually, California has great curriculum, environmental studies curriculum, and it's a matter of getting it into schools. Um, Teachers are so, and let's let's set aside this past year of COVID for just a second, but teachers are so busy trying to teach the required curriculum. They don't often have the time or the resources. How do you, how do you pay for a bus to get to a natural area and, and do a field trip? Um, why is it that uh, schools in wealthier areas have those resources to go uh, engage with nature, but underserved communities do not? Those are the kind of things that we, we really need to address. But, but you'll find that a lot of uh, open space agencies, I, I'm not so sure about nonprofits, maybe David can a- address this, but we are partnering with school systems. We are taking animals into the classrooms, rehabilitated animals. We are inviting school groups to come out into nature. And one thing I want to just, I'm very proud of that we worked on in the last couple of years is we partnered with the Children's Discovery Museum of of San Jose to stand up a place called Bill's Backyard Bridge to Nature. And it was a place to invite children from the urban areas and their families to come experience what the ecosystems and habitats of the Bay Area are in a kind of a starter space, in a safe space. And then from there, start to go out to designated open space preserves with curriculum a couple times a year to learn about about nature. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but we need to put the money and the energy and the resources behind it. And I think coming out of COVID this year, there's a lot of interest in that. I also think that, oh, uh, David, go go ahead, fine. Okay, okay. So I think no matter even like the privileges that kids have and in wealthier communities or less privileged communities, I think it's really up to the kids themselves to take up the challenge on trying to help other people be interested. Like what I said, I had created a wildlife photography club with my friend and I believe that helped in some way. So it's just getting kids interested outside of school first with stuff like Audubon kids and then hoping that they find enough interest in that to impact their school and bring it out in other communities. That's really, that's really an amazing answer. Um, I've also met in teachers who have built curriculum around birds. Um, if you pick three migratory birds and follow them, if you just, um, trace their paths from south to north and back again. You can teach geography. You can teach biodiversity. You can teach culture. You can teach history by just focusing on like three different species of um, birds that come through Santa Clara County. It really, 
you know, I, I've met teachers who had like week long curriculum and did that. And it's just an amazing way to bring all of life together. Because w- when you look at birds and you get into biodiversity, you end up in a, in a fabulous place. You end up in the web of life. Wow. I can't think of any better way to finish up our program here than with that statement, uh, that we are all in the web of life. I think we've, we've learned quite a bit in this past year uh, about nature, about the environment, ourselves, and about birds. Uh, and it's been very enjoyable talking about that with you this uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so I'd like to thank Vayun and Andrea and David for joining us today and all of you uh, who are our audience We appreciate your questions, and we appreciate you joining us. As always, you can catch up on the remainder of our Silicon Valley Reads uh, panels and discussion groups at www.siliconvalleyreads.org. And you can also, uh, I believe if you registered, you'll be receiving an email that will be sent with links about nature and birds from David and Andrea's talks. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful week. Thank you.